this morning. Father God, we are here to praise you. We are here to celebrate you. And Father God, we are here to say thank you for what Jesus has done for every single one of us. Thank you, God. Father God, we just uh, adore you. And in this moment, in this place, we welcome you. Holy Spirit, we know you are here. Move in this place, God, so that we can come to a greater understanding the depths you went to, the road you traveled so you could save us from our sins. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And Jesus, Jesus, that you went to the cross for us. You went to a tomb for us. But more so, you came out of the tomb for us. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. And Father God, for every body of believers, every church around the globe today that's celebrating you, we ask for your blessing. We ask that you would receive our praise this morning, God, because what you've done is just unimaginable. And I know that each and every one of us could always say thank you. It's not enough, but we say thank you. We do that with our praise today. We do that with our words, with our song, with our lives. God, help us. Help us share that love with the people around us too. In Jesus' name, amen.
We give Jesus a big shout of praise this morning on Resurrection Sunday. Come on, we love you, Lord. Come on, there's nothing like today, is there? Today's different. And every day we come into God's house, we're lifting up the name of Jesus. But on this day, we are reminded that there's a garden tomb in Jerusalem that holds no body that holds no person and people travel from thousand miles every single year from all over the world to see an empty tomb and an empty grave come on our faith is different we are not like any other faith because our Savior is risen and our Lord is seated in heaven right now next to his father come on if the tomb is empty then anything is possible if the tomb is empty then everything changes amen Boy, what a great day it is, man. Come on, look at someone and say, Happy Easter. Now look at your second choice, the person that you didn't want to talk to, and tell them, Happy Resurrection Sunday. Happy Resurrection Sunday. Everybody looks so good, man. Everybody's so nicely dressed. Somebody's like, we should do this every single week. We should dress this nice. <laughs> You're like, did you know how long it took me to get the kids out of the house today? Hey, on your way in, you, you should have received some communion. Why don't we go ahead and get that in our hand right now? Lindsay, would you help me open that? Thank you. <laughs> Look, it wasn't me, it doesn't work. Awesome. Yeah, some of our team will help get you what you need. If you don't have one, just lift a hand. Our team's coming down the aisle. Kristen, I think we have someone right here down on the second row. and I see some people right over there. Well, maybe you were a part of a, a Good Friday service and you took communion just a couple days ago, but on this Resurrection Sunday, we wanna stop and we wanna remember Jesus again and his sacrifice for us. 
So as you take that bread, the Bible says that on the night Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it. And he said, this bread represents my body, which is broken for you. And as often as you partake of this, you do this in remembrance of me. And so this morning, Jesus, as we gather to celebrate you and your victory over sin and death and the grave, Lord, we remember your broken body. And we thank you that because of your brokenness, we can be mended, we can be made whole. Lord, we honor you today. We remember that you did what we could not do, that you were perfection incarnate. Lord, we honor you this morning as we receive this, your body. In Jesus' name we pray. Let's take the bread. The Bible says in like manner he took the cup and Jesus on this last meal with his disciples he said this cup represents the blood of a new covenant and as often as you take this drink you do so in remembrance of me love that Jesus mentioned a new covenant he said new covenant because there was an old one the old covenant required a sacrificial system if you wanted to be right before God it required you to make routine traditional sacrifices with animals that you would have to come to his temple into his courts and you would sacrifice for you and your family but under this new covenant come on Jesus was the sacrificial lamb and on this day not only do we remember that he was a sacrificial lamb on that cross that was meant for you and I but on this particular day we are reminded that when he returns again he's not coming as a lamb He's coming as a lion, and he's coming to rule, and he's coming to reign. But Jesus, we thank you that you bore our sin. Can't imagine the weight that was on that cross. That in your mind's eye, you saw each and every one of us, and you knew us by name. And God, you died for our past, present, and every future sin. Lord, you washed it with your blood. And though our sins are like scarlet, you wash us white as snow. We thank you for your blood, Jesus, and we remember you and your sacrifice. Come on, let's take the drink together. Lord, we love you this morning. And all that we do and say today, I pray that it would bring glory to your name, God. Just as we've worshiped you in song, we're gonna worship you in other ways this morning, in our giving, through the receiving of the word. God, receive your worship. The Bible says that worship is like a fragrance in the heavens. Lord, receive your worship this morning. King of all kings, Lord of all lords, Savior of the world, in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. Come on, one more time, let's put our hands together if you can. What an awesome Resurrection Sunday. I know our house kids are hanging out with us today, some of our older ones, but right now, even before you take your seat, why don't you turn around, tell someone one more time, man, Happy Easter. Welcome into Legacy House. It's gonna be a great morning. Sunday. Jen and I have a few announcements for you this morning. And the first one is that right after the service, I know our kids are excited about this one. We've got an egg hunt directly after service, right through these doors in our courtyard over here. I believe we have 3,000 eggs. So we have a lot of eggs for our kids to go and find. So we're going to have a lot of fun. We've got the Easter bunny out there as well. Yes. And then another... Am I on? 
Yeah. Another exciting announcement for our house kids is we are opening VBS registration today. Yes. So we will have VBS. We are partnering with Redeemer Church. That's June 10th through the 14th. And registration opens today. I believe there are limited spots. So you'll want to go ahead and sign up. That's right. Um, next announcement. I'm very excited about this one. If you were a woman in this room, this announcement is for you. We're having a women's brunch coming up this Saturday, April 6th. Yes, we are excited. We are so excited to welcome you. Um, you can register for that on the Legacy House app. It's at 11 a.m. Um, and make sure that you do RSVP. It's gonna be in a clubhouse in a gated community. So if you don't RSVP, we will not have your name on the gate. So make sure you hop over on the Legacy app right now while you're thinking about it and go ahead and register for the women's brunch. We are so excited. Um, we've been planning it. We are praying over it and it's gonna be an incredible time for our women to gather. And then the very next day, this is one of our favorite events of the year. We're doing DNA. That's a night where you can come and learn all about Legacy House. So that's for if you are volunteering currently, if you're interested in volunteering, or if you just want to get more connected, you can find out about Legacy House. You can find out about all of our different ministries and teams. And we would love to share that night with you. Again, you can register on our app. You can scan the QR code right behind us and see all of our events listed right there. Yes, and last but not least, right after the service, we're gonna have some prayer team down here. So if you are here and you need prayer, maybe it's for healing, maybe you're going through something, maybe you just need to share something with someone. If you want prayer, we wanna pray with you. And so make sure you don't leave today without getting prayer. So directly after the service, we'll have our prayer team right down here. Uh, and that's it for Jen and I. Now let's get ready to receive the message. Hey, Legacy House, will you join me? Put our hands together. Let's welcome everyone that's with us online right now. So glad that you're joining in. We know that on this uh, special Easter and Resurrection Sunday, sometimes you got church family that are visiting other uh, family members in other states, and, uh, and so maybe you're gonna watch this message later, but uh, if you are tuning in live, we're really glad that you're with us this morning. And hey, a special welcome to all of our visitors right now as well, man. Let's put our hands together if it's your first time. We're thankful that you're here. You could have chosen a lot of great churches in our area uh, to worship with, but we count it a great privilege uh, that you're with us this morning. Uh, we're a young church. We're a church plant, as you can see, meeting in a high school auditorium, but man, just look around at what God's doing. It's so awesome uh, that we can be a part of, uh, of what God's doing here in St. John's County, amen? If you have your Bible, open up to Luke chapter 24. Luke chapter 24 is where we're gonna get. And uh, I do wanna let all of our, I know our, our house kids are with us today, but uh, if you are a mom or a dad and your little one's just getting a little restless and you need to catch a break, we, we actually have TVs that are streaming in the foyer. We wanna remind you that it's totally fine if you need to step out into the foyer for a minute and you can still be watching and participating in service today. Uh, but I'm so excited uh, to share, man. God gave me this word. And um, Easter Sundays are just different, you know? They're different. And I woke up this morning and I was just thankful for Jesus. I look back at my life and I just see how far God has brought me, how good he has been. You know, some days you need to wake up and you need to just take inventory of the goodness of God in your life. You need to be reminded of how good Jesus is. And that's what today is all about, that he is a good God. And he wasn't just good 2,000 years ago. He's still good today. And he's still loving us today, and he's still giving us more grace than we deserve today, and his mercies are still new every single day, and I'm just so grateful for the goodness of God. And we're going to talk about what Jesus did for us this morning right here in Luke chapter 24, and as I often do, let me give you a little bit of context as to where we're going to begin reading right here. So the Bible says that Jesus, when he came to earth, 
He had an earthly ministry for three years. Bible tells us that he had 12 main disciples, 12 young men that followed him around during this earthly ministry. And often what they would do is they would write down things that they heard and things that they saw Jesus do. And in this moment that you and I are about to read in Luke chapter 24, we find that all of these disciples are just absolutely crushed. They're absolutely distraught. Why? Because for three years, they followed a rabbi and a teacher named Jesus that they believe was the Messiah. They thought, man, he's going to defeat Rome. He's going to set up a new kingdom. And now all the Jewish people are going to be in charge. But the problem is, is that three days ago, he was murdered on a cross by religious leaders and Romans. And so they thought Jesus was the one, but now Jesus is dead. And, and so all who believed in him, watch this, are devastated. All who rejected him feel very validated. Ah, we knew he wasn't the one. We, we knew that wasn't the Messiah. Everyone who rejected and did not believe in Jesus, they're feeling very validated because his body, or so they think, lies in a tomb outside the city. The disciples are probably feeling feelings of confusion. Some are angry. Some are upset. Some are even feeling perhaps hopelessness. I thought about that this morning when I woke up. If you have ever navigated any emotions like that, you're actually in really good company because the disciples felt that exact same way. Even those closest to Jesus had moments of being angry and upset and confused at what was going on in life. That's where we pick up our reading in Luke chapter 24, verse 1. It says this. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices that they had prepared and they went to the tomb. And they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. I told our team early this morning, and I've said it before from this stage. Listen to me, church. The stone was not rolled away for Jesus to get out. It was rolled away for doubters to get in. Jesus didn't need a rock pushed out of his way to get to where he needed to go. That's not why the stone was rolled away. Jesus didn't need help in that regard. It was rolled away so that everyone who doubted him could step into that empty tomb and see that there is no body laying there. In fact, the garden tomb in Jerusalem is the only historical site in the world that is famous for who and what is not there. You ever thought about it like that? People buy plane tickets to Jerusalem. They spend thousands of dollars to go see what? An empty room. It's the only one of its kind. All other religions of the world, aside from Christianity, it's different. Their, their tombs are full. You can go to Saudi Arabia and you can see where Muhammad is buried. He's buried in a tomb in Saudi Arabia. You, you, the, it, it is recorded, it is very known knowledge and recorded that Buddha's ashes, when he was cremated, his ashes were spread to different parts of Asia in these different temples. You can go and see where his ashes are. E even the, the founder of Scientology, Ron Hubbard, it is recorded that he was cremated. His ashes were spread in the Pacific Ocean. Even, even other patriarchs of the, the Bible that we enjoy reading about, Moses had a grave, Abraham had a grave, and even Jesus had a tomb. The only difference is Jesus was just borrowing it. He wasn't going to need it very long. He was just leasing that thing. <laughs> he only borrowed it for three days. Verse three, but when they entered, the women entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. Come on, somebody say amen. And listen, they still haven't for over 2,000 years. I thought about this. I was talking to Bethany, my wife, a couple days ago. I think it's interesting that in our modern day with all of the technology and, and IT that we have, you mean to tell me that we can find famous ships at the bottom of the ocean and we can find treasure that has been missing for centuries and centuries. We can put a rover on the planet Mars. We can do all of these miraculous things, but with our current technology, you mean to tell me we can't seem to find the body of the most famous and controversial human being that has ever walked the face of the earth? Reason you can't find it is because he's risen. He's not there. You can't find his body. I mean, if you wanted to stop Christianity, if you hated Christianity so much 
and you wanted to put an end and you wanted to close the door of every church across the world, all you would have to do is produce a body. Produce a body and guys like me, shut up. But you can't because he's not there. He's risen. Our faith is different than every other faith in the earth. Verse four, and while they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. And in their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground, but the men said to them, and this is such a great question, why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here, he is risen. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee? The son of man must be delivered over into the hands of sinners, be crucified on the third day, and be raised again. And then they remembered his words. When they came back from the tomb, they told all these things to the 11 and to all the others. And it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary, the mother of James and all the others with them who told this to the apostles. But they did not believe the women because their words seemed to them like nonsense. Peter, however, got up, ran to the tomb, bending over. He saw the strips of linen lying by themselves and he went away wondering to himself what had happened. You're taking notes on this Resurrection Sunday. I just wanna speak, it's a short message today, but I'd love to speak about the living among the dead. The living among the dead. So Lord, one more time, Jesus, be glorified in your house today. Be glorified in our lives. You are risen, you are alive, you defeated the enemy of our souls. And we worship you today, God. You're not like anybody else. Yes, you came in the form of a man and you walked this earth, same as us, but Jesus, you're different, you're God. You're the Lord of all lords and the King of all kings and we worship you this morning in Jesus' name, amen? Amen, Amen. the living among the dead. Let me ask you a question on this Easter Sunday. Have you ever had a moment in life that you felt was too big for you? Moment was just too big for you, too big for you to understand, too big for you to grasp. The moment was just too big. I came across something the other day about a child psychologist who was writing, and and it was really fascinating because they were writing about the fact that children, when children are born into the world, they're born into a world where everything is too big for them. I mean, think about, I mean, we probably can't think that far back for ourselves, but think about those of us who have had little babies and toddlers just when they start to crawl, maybe just when they start to walk. They are walking in a land of giants. Everything is too big for them. Chairs are too big for them. Countertops are too big for them. Uh, Everything, doorknobs are too big for them. Doors, it is all too big for them. Nothing about the world makes the child believe that they belong in the world that they were born into. Everything is too big for them. And I thought, you know, as we get older, perhaps we grow into the world physically, but emotionally and spiritually, we still have plenty of times when we're looking at life, saying to ourselves, I'm not big enough to handle this. I don't think, I'm not big enough to understand this. I'm not big enough to grasp this. I'm, 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 I'm getting close to 40 and I still have those moments. I bet there's people in their 50s and 60s and 70s in this room today and, and maybe you still have moments in life where you're like, I know I'm on the back nine of life, but I still don't feel big enough for this moment that is in front of me. Say all that to say so that you'll understand that's the kind of moment the disciples are looking at right now. This moment is is big, perhaps too big for them. They don't feel big enough to understand what's going on. It's bad enough that the man they thought was going to take over is now dead, but now his body isn't even in the tomb they left it in. (laughs) They got questions, right? It's a big moment. They did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. Now here's the thing. Dead bodies are supposed to be where dead bodies were left. Just kind of how it works. If there's anything great about death, if, if we could say it like that, here's the great thing about death. It's very trustworthy. You know what I mean? Everybody in the cemetery cooperates. 
No one's out of line. They're right where you left them. They never move. You know what I mean? But, but isn't it fascinating that this man, Jesus, God, that we're worshiping this morning, not only did, did he not make a, a lot of friends maybe on this earth because he wouldn't cooperate with the religious system of this world. And so the Pharisees didn't like him and the Sadducees didn't like him. And people didn't like the fact that Jesus did not cooperate with their system. But not only did he not cooperate with the religious system, he won't even cooperate with death. Jesus won't cooperate. Why? Because you cannot cooperate with what you plan on defeating. And do you know why you and I are here this morning? You know why it's full on a Sunday morning in churches all across our city? We're here doing what we're doing today because Jesus would not cooperate with death. And he defeated it. But then this angel shows up in verse 5. Arguably the most important question in all of scripture. Why do you look for the living among the dead? I believe if the women that day were to give an honest response, their response would be this. We're not. We're here looking for the dead among the dead. We, we didn't even know that we should be looking for the living among the dead. I, I thought about this. Have you ever had someone tell you something that you couldn't believe, so you just didn't even bother remembering it? Because the angels were like, hey, don't you remember? Jesus told you like this. But, but, but it was almost like when Jesus said it, they thought it was just so crazy, or, or they just didn't have room for that in their mind. They just completely forgot about it. They didn't even bother filing it away in their mind. See, that's the thing about the story of Jesus. That's the thing about the resurrection of Jesus and the prophecies about Jesus and the good news about Jesus. Truthfully, it is all nonsense until it makes sense. That's what scripture says. Scripture says it's like foolishness. Even right there, we just read it in verse 11. They did not believe the women, the other disciples. Why? Because their words seem like nonsense. Oh man, it's, it's nonsense until it makes sense. I'll be honest, I used to get so frustrated with atheists that were in my life or maybe a friend or two here or there that just didn't believe in God, didn't believe in, in anything. I would get so frustrated with them. It's like, oh my gosh, why can't you just believe? And why can't I would just try to explain it and rationalize all the thinking and try to help him? And I would get so frustrated. But then one day the Holy Spirit kind of reminded me, he's like, Clay, listen, truthfully, it's nonsense. <laughs> it's all nonsense until it makes sense. How does it make sense? Faith, come on. Faith is the key that is needed to helping it make sense. I heard it said like this one time, faith is believing in advance what will only make sense in reverse. Faith is what's needed. And so for those individuals in my life who were far from God, I, I, I would obviously routinely be praying for their salvation. Oh, God, I pray that you would save them. I pray that they would come to the saving knowledge. And that's a good prayer to pray. We can all pray stuff like that for our friends. But, but the Lord help me because first and foremost, I need to pray that they receive the gift of faith. You got to have the gift of faith before you can get the gift of salvation. And so my prayer kind of shifted. Lord, give them the gift of faith. That's the key, and they need that key for this to make sense. God, give them the gift of faith. It's all nonsense until it makes sense. Faith is a gift. Verse 12, Peter, here he is. He gets up. He runs to the tomb, and bending over, he saw strips of linen lying by themselves, and he went away wondering to himself what had happened. I love Resurrection Sunday so much because it's a chance for me to tell you what happened. Peter's wondering in this moment, and I get to help you understand this morning. What was happening in this moment is Jesus was making a definitive statement with that empty tomb. And the statement is this, is that he is victorious over the final enemy, which is death, hell, sin, and the grave. Jesus is victorious. Listen to me, church. Jesus is not just a teacher. He's not just a rabbi. He's not just a prophet. He's not just a really good guy. He is, in fact, the savior of the world. And the resurrection is what solidifies his title as savior. You, you cannot be the savior if you yourself need saving. Jesus didn't need saving because he did the defeating. 
It's the resurrection that solidifies that title, that he is the Savior. Listen to me, friends. If Jesus was still in the grave, then you and I are some of the most pathetic people on the face of the planet. We're wasting a really good Sunday. I bet there's some killer brunch right now in Ponte Vedra somewhere that we could all be really, really enjoying. And we should be there if Jesus is still in that tomb. If he is still in the grave, then Paul even said that we are some of the most pathetic people on the face of the planet, wasting all of this energy with phony worship and phony hope. But listen to me, friends. If that tomb is empty, which it is, and they cannot find his body, which they can't, and he is seated next to God the Father in heaven on the right hand of God the Father, which he is, then listen, you and I, we worship this morning a risen Savior who is victorious over the enemy of our souls, and he gives us the power and the authority to walk in him and through him and be just as victorious. Boy, Jesus is different. Jesus is alive. If the tomb is empty, everything changes. If the tomb is empty, then anything is possible. Anything is possible. You know, that moment on this early morning in Luke chapter 24, that moment wasn't for God. It was for us. Jesus did not need to prove to himself that he is more powerful than death. He got up out of that grave so that he could prove to you that you can be more powerful than death. That when we live our lives in faith, surrender to him, that we have the same power that lifted Jesus from the grave. Look what it says in Romans chapter 8 and 11. The spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. Come on, that's every Christ follower. And just as God raised Jesus Christ from the dead, he will give life to mortal bodies by the same spirit living within you. Death is not the end of the story if your story includes Jesus. Heard it said one time, and I wrote it in my notes, that you get to decide in this life how many times you're born. Saying what? Follow me on this. If you're only born once, you die twice. We're all born naturally. That's why we're here in the room right now. There was a natural birth. We're all born once. But if you're only ever born once, then there's actually two deaths. There's going to be a natural death. But then there's going to be a second death that ultimately separates you from eternity from Jesus and God the Father. But if you're born twice, you only die once. If you're, if you're born in the natural, but then you're born again through faith, by the Spirit of God, you're born into the family of God as a son and a daughter of God. And if you're born twice, you only die once. Because after your natural death, the rest of the way is just eternal life with Jesus. As the band joins me right now, I want to get back to this question as we wrap up. This question that is not just the question of the hour. I think it's the question of our lives. Truth be told, in verse 5, why do you look for the living among the dead? Whether you realize it or not, every single person is searching for the feeling of being alive. It's the attempt of culture. It's, it's what our possessions try to do for us. It's why businesses exist, and they're trying to sell you all of their products every single waking hour of the day. Everyone is trying to tell you, oh, you need this and you'll really feel alive. And if you wanna really feel alive, if you, if you wanna really do some living, oh, you gotta drive this car and you gotta live in that house and, and, and you gotta look like this and be like this and have this and, and that, oh, you're really gonna be living if you'll just get this. We're all on a search for life. We're all on a search for significance, for meaning. We want to feel like we're really living. But the problem is, is that so many people are looking for the living in all the wrong places. And even as I said that, yes, the Johnny Lee country song, looking for love in all the wrong places just came to my mind. Can I just pause on this Easter Sunday, by the way, and say, church, listen, I'm not even really a country music fan, but this is what Peter Deering is doing to me, Okay. This is the effect that he's having on me. Country music references are just popping up in Easter messages now, okay? So I blame Peter.
In fact, let's go into a chorus of looking for love. And oh, no, I'm just kidding. I digress. So many people are looking for life in all of the wrong places. And the question this morning is this, church. Are you among that population? Are you among the population of people looking for the living in all of the wrong places? Came across a story. I want to read it so that I can get it right. I thought this kind of teed it up perfectly. It says, there's a story about a man who lost his keys one night. It was dark out and he was searching for them underneath a street light and a police officer saw him and stopped to help. And he asked the man, hey, what are you, what are you looking for? Well, I'm looking for my car keys, he said. I just can't seem to find them. The police officer nodded and helped him look around the area underneath the street light. They looked all over the area, but they could not find the keys. And after several minutes, the police officer asked him if he was sure he lost the keys in this spot. And the man replied, oh, no, I, I lost them in the park. And the officer said, well, then why are you looking for him on the street? That's simple, the man said. There's more light here. Wouldn't be able to find anything in that dimly lit park. Church, the spiritual lesson is this. As humans... We know that we are missing something precious, but we don't often want to look for it where the search is difficult. And so instead we search where it's easy, but where the precious thing that we are looking for cannot possibly ever be found. You will never find abundant life apart from Jesus. But yet we live in a society and a culture where people are trying to search in the easiest place every single day. Sometimes the search of faith, in faith, it just feels too difficult for some and so they refuse to search there but they'll just go out into the world and, and they'll try to find some sort of life and living in all of these other places but they'll never find it because the precious thing is not there. I want to encourage you, if you haven't already this morning, search in the place of faith. Search in the place of the scriptures. Search in the face of Jesus. That's where the precious thing can be found. You will never find significance. You will never find meaning. You will never find value. You will never find salvation apart from Jesus. It's just as foolish as trying to find the living among the dead. So this morning, I want to give you just three quick things. I got to rattle these off and then we're done. Some people don't ever feel like they went to church unless they got three points. So let me give you three points on a resurrection Sunday, right? Make sure everyone can sleep tonight. All of our OCD church family got to get your three points. The first one is this. Why should you seek the living one who is Jesus, number one? Because the living one is who he claimed to be. John 14 and verse 6, Jesus said, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No one gets to God the Father except by means of me. Now, I'll be the first to say that's a strong claim. That's, that's a strong claim there, Jesus. But what does Jesus do? He backs it up with the resurrection. Jesus isn't a guy who just says clever stuff. He doesn't just say, say clever things. He's not just a guy who can, who's good at kind of turning a phrase and making it nice. No, whatever he said, he backed it up when he got up out of the tomb on his own accord and he rose from the dead. T take note as well while we're here in John chapter 14 that Jesus did not say, I am a way. He did not say, I'm a good way. He did not say, I am one of the ways. He said, I am the way. Unless you're going through the door of Jesus Christ, you are not getting to the God, God the Father in heaven. Jesus is the, you know, like, like, so for everyone out there, and I'm just, this, let me just step on a soapbox for just a second. For everyone that's in our world that basically says, ah, well, you know, kind of all faiths are the same and all roads lead to heaven. It, that, that is foolishness. That is just as foolish as me assuming that I could just pick up my phone and dial any series of digits and get my wife on the other line. 
It's not how it works. No, there is a number, the number that must be dialed if I wanna connect to my wife on the other line. You don't just get to type in whatever you want. There's a specific number. Church, hear me this morning. There is a specific Savior. He's the only one. Jesus, if you want heaven, Jesus is the door. Please don't be fooled by anyone else out there saying anything different. He's not a way. He is the way. And all doors do not lead to heaven. And all religions are not the same. And all faiths don't eh, pretty much all say the same thing. They don't. Ours is different. Jesus is not just a teacher. He is God. And he's the savior of the world. Number two, why should you seek the living one? Because the living one has the power he claimed to have. John 10 and 18. No one, this is Jesus talking, no one can take my life from me. I sacrifice it voluntarily. You know, the only reason the Romans could kill Jesus is because he let them. They didn't take Jesus' life. That's not, you can't do that. He let you. He let you put him on a cross. Bible says in a, in a second, he could have called down legions of angels to wipe everybody out. But he stayed on the cross. Why? For the joy set before him. What was the joy? Maybe it's better said, who was the joy? You. You were the reason he stayed up there voluntarily, willingly sacrificing himself. He says, for I have the authority and the power to lay my life down when I want to, and I can also take it up again. He has the power he claimed to have, and he backs it up with the resurrection. And the third one is this. Why should you seek the living one? Because the living one did what he promised to do. Jesus says of himself in Mark chapter 10 and verse 34, he says, they will mock him, they'll spit on him, they'll flog him with a whip, and they'll kill him, but after three days, he will rise again. Boy, Jesus is a man of his word. And he didn't just say it because he thought he would look cool in front of the disciples in Mark chapter 10. He said it, and then by the end of the book, he backs it up with the resurrection in the empty tomb. There's a movie I came across the other day. I think it was actually released a couple years ago when it was called 13 Lives. True story about a rescue mission in Thailand. I think the movie was directed by Ron Howard, but, but the story goes that there was a soccer team and their coach that were trapped in these deep underground caves that began to flood. And all of these individuals, they were trapped there for 18 days with limited oxygen in this movie, 13 Lives. The fascinating part about this true story was that people and help from all over the world descended upon Thailand to try to strategize how are we gonna get all of these young men and their coach up from out of these caves. I mean, people came from all over the world to seek and to search for these lost men in the caves. And the message is truly pretty simple on a Sunday morning, Easter, Resurrection Sunday. I feel like there's some of us who are in the room, maybe people watching online, maybe people are gonna catch this message later this month or a year down the road. Sometimes you ask yourself, maybe your life feels like you're in a bit of a cave and you're wondering, does anyone even care enough about me to search for me? And it's my joy and privilege to tell you this morning that the answer to that question is yes. And his name is Jesus. One of the greatest differences that separates our faith from all others is that our great God began a search for you a long time ago. I know this morning we've been talking a lot about us looking for him and, and, and us looking for the living. And, and, but, but truth be told, before you ever thought about searching for Jesus, he was already searching for you. God was not the one that was lost. I know a lot of times in church we'll say, oh man, so-and-so found Jesus. Praise God, man, they finally found God. And I understand what we're saying, and, and it's still okay to say I'm not bashing it. But truth be told, you didn't find God because God wasn't lost. He found you. 
and he found me. We were lost. And Jesus began this search thousands of years ago. That's what the scripture tells us. Why did he come? To seek and to save, to search for and to save. The empty tomb makes it possible for you and him to be together for all eternity. And the great news about this day, man, is if that tomb is empty, then anything is possible. If that tomb is empty, then everything changes. If that tomb is empty, then Jesus has the power he said he has, he is who he says he is, and he can do what he says he can do. Boy, if that tomb is empty, then every other promise in God's word is still good today. If that tomb is empty, then that abundant life the Bible speaks of, it is still available today. If that tomb is empty, then he is still saving individuals today. He is still washing away sin. He is still making us white as snow. If the tomb is empty, everything changes. If the tomb is empty, I can be filled. You can be filled. And I don't know where you and the Lord are at this morning. I know that this many people in the room, there's some here and, and you and God are doing great and you've been serving him for some years. But some of you, you're unsure about your relationship with Jesus. And there is no reason to walk out of here this morning with a question mark hanging over your eternity. Boy, God is here and he loves you. He's not a condemner waiting to punish you. So many people view God the wrong way. And if you view him the wrong way, you will approach him the wrong way. If you view God as a harsh, punishing, heavy, weighty condemner, then of course you're, you're going you're to cower. You're not going to want to come close to a God like that as if he has his hand cocked back ready to, to slap you upside the head. No, no. If, if God the Father wanted to send if he, if he wanted to condemn the world, he would have sent a condemner. But as it is, he wanted to save the world, so he sent a savior. Well, Jesus is here this morning. And with every head bowed and every eye closed, I wanna give somebody an opportunity to respond to him. He's alive, he's alive, he's alive. The Bible says salvation, it's, it's not like a, some lengthy 12 step program. The Bible says when we repent in our heart and we confess with our mouth that Jesus Christ is the son of God, that he was raised from the dead, the Bible says you can be saved. He's already extending his grace. Just receive that gift of faith and place it in the person of Jesus. He's here. Come on. And maybe you brought somebody with you this morning. Maybe you're thinking of a loved one, a family member, man. Just be, just be praying for that person right now. Maybe you got family members that are going to watch this later online. Just be praying for that person right now. Lord, speak to him right now. Speak to him. Don't miss the moment. Don't miss the moment. Jesus is here. And if you know this morning that you need to place faith in the only risen savior that this world has ever seen. I want to invite you on the count of three to lift your hand just so I know who I'm praying for. I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to bring you on stage or do anything like that, but just right where you are. I just want to know who I am agreeing in prayer with today. You're saying, yeah, I need Jesus. I, I want to repent and I want to come to Jesus Christ. I want to be saved. I want to be that new life. I want to put my trust, I want to be devoted to him. If that's you on the count of three, put your hand up. One, two, three. Come on, who am I praying with this morning? Amen, thank you. Come on, anyone, I see a hand in the back. Anyone else? Anyone else this morning? Today's your day, man. Don't miss the moment. Awesome, thank you. See you in the back. Thank you so much. You can put your hands down. Hey church, why don't you repeat this prayer after me? It looks like there's several people that might be praying it for the very first time this morning. Let's just pray it 
like a church family. Come on, that's what we are. Does everyone say, Lord Jesus, this morning, I thank you for your death, burial, and your resurrection. You are alive. You are seated in heaven. And you save my soul through faith and repentance. I confess with my mouth and I believe in my heart that you are the Son of God. You are who you said you were. You have the power you said you have, and you can do what you said you can do. From this day on, I am yours, you are mine. I stop living life my own way. I yield to you, I yield to your ways. I follow you, I desire to be obedient to your word and the following of the Holy Spirit. Jesus, save me. God, I thank you that you're doing a saving work in people's life right now. Thank you that you see hearts. Even me on this stage, God, I can't see hearts, but you see hearts. And God, you're saving souls right now. And it's the greatest miracle that could ever take place in a church service in a moment like this. Gosh, may we never get too used to or or downplay these moments of seeing people go from death to life. It's the greatest miracle on this side of eternity. Lord, we love you and we thank you and we worship you today. Come on, church, why don't we stand to our feet right now? Why don't we stand to our feet? Come on, it's a good morning. I, I know on Friday, maybe, maybe on Friday, it was kind of a somber service and we were remembering his death and his sacrifice, but today is not somber. Today is celebratory. Today is a chance to get loud. Today is a chance to clap our hands. Today is an opportunity to lift our voice. Come on, today is a chance to, to lift a shout of praise, to tell God that we love him, to let him know that there is none like you, Lord, in all the earth. We worship you, our risen Savior. We worship you, King of Kings. We worship you, Lord of Lords. Come on, let's sing it right now. Let's go.
Hey, real quick, I would just love Peter just to lead us in that hymn one more time. Just one more chorus before we're dismissed. If you want to lift your hands, come on, let's just go out and sing this together like a big choir. One more time, oh precious. Oh. 